Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and welcome to our first edition of my podcast. This is actually the second episode that I did, but the first one I called it uh, episode zero because it was kind of a test to see if there was any interest in it, and there certainly was. So we're going to continue this experiment uh, every month and see how it works. These are going to be long form things. I might just ramble on for an hour or uh, preferably I'll bring on a guest and ramble with somebody together to talk about a topic related to some of the tech things that we talk about on my YouTube channel, which is at lon.tv. And today we're going to talk a bit about RetroArch and emulation in general. And uh, this is something I've been doing for the last 20 years or so, which is basically booting up software design for other types of computers on my PC, or more recently, my Android box or some handheld devices that I have. And it's a great way uh, to enjoy a lot of the games you might have played as a younger individual. Uh, and in my case, I like to play the Atari 2600 and the ColecoVision and some of the Nintendo and Super Nintendo and Genesis stuff. And there's always something to play in my house. And it's been uh, due in part to some of these emulators. Now, I've been emulating probably since 1993 or so. I remember getting a Mac Power Book from my dad right before I headed off to college. And uh, that little Mac, although it wasn't all that powerful by today's standards, was powerful enough to run its own operating system and also boot up the old Apple II C games that I used to play when I was younger. Uh, that was kind of the first like gee whiz thing when it came to emulation that you could actually run an old computer on a current one. Uh, there was another commercial emulator that I also picked up called Virtual PC. I think it was by a company called Connectix that allowed you to not only to uh, boot up DOS, but also run, I think, Windows 3.1 on the Mac also. It wasn't a great experience, but it was able to do it and uh, run software like Microsoft Word or something fairly well, enough that you could get uh, some things done if you were getting Windows disks from people and whatnot. So that was kind of the earlier stages of it. Uh, but then as the 90s roared along, there was, of course, the Pentium processor that started making its way out into the marketplace. The 486s got faster and faster as well. And uh, there was a lot of movement in the general emulation space to the point where really these groups that we know today, like MAME, uh, started coming together. And in fact, uh, on April 2nd, 1998, I was interviewed for the Hartford Current. Uh, about MAME and how I was playing games on MAME, these old arcade games, uh, back in 1998. And MAME had launched in 97, which was a multi-arcade game emulator that would boot up all these old coin-op games from the 80s, and they ran great on a pretty low-end Pentium or 486 computer at the time, which was remarkable, and people were really getting into this thing. And MAME uh, was formed to try to get a singular interface around uh, this activity of emulation. Uh, coincidentally, the article that I appeared in, which you can find at lon.tv slash MAME98, uh, was published 20 years ago to today. Today, April 2nd, uh, 2018, is when I'm recording this video, and this article actually appeared uh, exactly 20 years ago in 98. Very coincidental that that happened to be today. I was just looking at that. There was also some great news sites out there, like the EMU News Service that was following all these rapid developments. It was crazy. You could wake up one day and all of a sudden a system that you were hoping might be emulated would suddenly be emulated and emulated perfectly. Uh, and on the screen right now, I've got a uh, link to the EMU News Service, which you can find at lon.tv slash EMU News. This is on archive.org. And on the headline for January 30th, 1999, is the announcement that a great emulator called Ultra HLE was being discontinued. Uh, and this was an emulator that came out of nowhere, got announced on one of these emulation sites one day, and it could run the Nintendo 64 in 1998-99 perfectly. In fact, it did it better than the actual system did, and it was so good that the authors were <laughs> concerned that they might get sued by Nintendo, so they discontinued uh, making the emulator. Uh, at this point, uh, Sony was actually suing Connectix, the same people that made that virtual PC emulator I talked about earlier, because they made a Sony PlayStation emulator that worked quite well. Uh, the odd thing is Connectix won the lawsuit again that Sony had, had uh, filed against them, but uh, it cost them so much they ended up settling it with Sony and selling them the rights to the emulator just to get them off their back. So there was a lot of concern at this point that uh, emulator authors might get sued for what their users do with it. And they all kind of, uh, at least some of these good ones, kind of fizzled out at that time. But as we all know, things are much better today. So leading up now to today, uh, we're going to talk now to Hunter Collar, 
uh, who is with the Libre, uh, Lib, Lib Retro uh, group, which is an open source group that uh, is uh, developing front end and back end software for emulators. And you might know them better as RetroArc, which is the front end that they've developed. Uh, which can bring in all these different emulators yet allow you kind of a single point of configuration. They have greatly simplified uh, emulating in the 21st century and it's a great interview. We're going to talk for about an hour. Uh, we're going to go through the history of emulation and then talk about some of the legal concerns and then a more recent legal concern where um, some companies are out there uh, actually um, using the RetroArc source code illegally uh, and selling it as part of commercial products, which has become a, a more recent controversy in the emulation space. We're going to have a lot to talk about here, so let's listen to uh, what Hunter has to say, and I'll be back after the interview. And joining me now is Hunter Collar from the uh, Lib Retro Group. And as we were talking before the show, Hunter, there's there's no formal designations in this in this open source community, but you are right. a contributor in many ways. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what you do with Lib Retro, and then we'll talk about what it does and emulation in general. Most of what people know me uh, from with Lib Retro is that I do a lot of the work on the forums and a lot of the user facing uh, outreach as far as the, I deal with uh, posting on Reddit uh, over at the emulation subreddit. And um, as I said, I run our forums and I do a lot of the end user support. I also do most of the uh, maintenance and development on our uh, pixel shaders. And uh, occasionally I do small work on the uh, individual cores or RetroArch as the front end, but mostly user stuff and shaders are my main bag. So you're kind of a jack of all trades in, in many ways. <laughs> well, we pretty much all are. We're, we're a pretty small team of um, six to ten main contributors uh, that drop in and out as our real lives allow. Mm. And um, then just between us, we, we do what we can when we can do it. And it's funny is I don't think people, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the interview here, but people don't realize as big as this thing, Red, Lib Retro and RetroArch and everything appear, um, it isn't a company and it relies right. upon volunteers to do to do all the work. So we'll, we'll talk yes. about that in a few minutes. <clears throat> Why don't we start, though, with emulation in general? Um, mm -hmm. I have been emulating for, for probably the better part of 20 years. My, my first emulation was... Um, actually, a commercial emulator that I bought for a PowerBook that I owned in the early 90s, and then I learned that my PowerBook could also run the old Apple II, and it kind of went uh, up, up from there. Uh, why don't you talk about what emulation is for someone who's never heard of it before? I'm sure people are okay. using it all the time and not realizing it, but I think it's important to get a definition first. So why don't you tell us about that? The um, Starting really broad, uh, emulation in general is just a way of one computer interpreting programs that are written for another computer. Um, the way that most people uh, experience it is things like um, VirtualBox or VMware, uh, in which you will emulate another computer inside of your computer. Um, the other way that a lot of people interact with it is with retro gaming emulation, which is uh, where LibRetro and RetroArch are most familiar. And that was uh, something. And sorry, I was, I was thinking. I was thinking. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's it's playing that Nintendo game inside of their their old NES game inside of their Nintendo Switch or their 3DS or something, right? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, there's a ton of commercial emulators. Uh, the Virtual Console. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, I guess that's even more familiar than VMware or uh, VirtualBox or anything. Yeah, um, yeah. Any pretty much any time you play an old game on a new console, there's an emulator involved somewhere, and it's just translating that old software to work on the new platform. It seems very difficult to me to do that because if I think about it, you know, even like the Nintendo or the Atari, uh, it's a very different processor than my computer, my Windows or my Mac computer might have. So what, what does it mm -hmm. take to write one of these things? Is this something that, I mean, obviously the knowledge now is well known, but uh, right. this is complicated, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, most definitely. And um, a lot of times the information just straight up isn't available. Uh, because the companies that originally made uh, the original consoles, you know, like a Nintendo or an Atari or whatever, uh, they they didn't exactly, for one, they didn't exactly document most of this stuff. They just made it and put it out there. And for two, they didn't really expect anybody to ever want to do what we're doing. And uh, and if, if they did expect it, they didn't want people doing it. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so they didn't really make the exhaustive, exhaustive documentation needed to actually write these things. So most of it, people have had to reverse engineer. 
um, where they look at the behavior of the console and they may take um, spec documents if they're using an off-the-shelf processor um, then or a modified version of an off-the-shelf processor. They'll take the uh, standard spec sheet and then they'll have to figure out where the holes are by running software on it and saying like, okay, well, uh, when I start up Super Mario Brothers, everything looks okay until I jump and then I fall off the world. Then they have to go back and say, what would make that happen and uh, try and fix the holes. So in some ways, it's kind of uh, maybe how the first PC clones were invented. You can't actually uh, take what Nintendo made. And if you did, you'd probably be in some kind of legal trouble uh, back, right. back in the time. So you almost have to reinvent the system to, to have it simula simulate or, I guess, emulate um, how the yeah, original yeah. worked, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and a lot of the legal questions around emulation were solved uh, or, you know, explored by, uh, like you were saying, the earlier PC emulation of um, the IBM clones and that kind of thing. Uh, that's that's a lot of the same laws apply here. So in other words, if you if you're not specifically co copying the hardware um, then or something proprietary, then then right. you're clear. And I guess that's why in some cases, uh, if I want to play maybe a PlayStation game or something, I have to get the BIOS, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and yep, so 100%. That's, and that's not something that you would distribute. So you're writing the code that, I guess, kind of connects with that BIOS, but the actual proprietary portion there, uh, people have to acquire on their own. Is that right? Right. And there are legal ways of doing that as well. Uh, luckily, um, there's um, bits in the law that allow us to dump our own um, software for backups and that kind of thing. Uh, and we rely on that to have a legal route to get things like a BIOS out of our PlayStation. So let's move on to Lib Retro because back mm -hmm. in the day when I started emulating, there was a, a million different ways to do it. Um, I think MAME uh, kind of organized itself in 1997 or so, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was the first real attempt, I think, to get some standardization across the board. Um, why don't you talk about what Lib Retro does? And I think most people probably, again, know you from RetroArch. So um, why don't you just take us from the top to the bottom and, and talk about how all this stuff interacts? Because my understanding of this is that you're trying to find a way to standardize some of the, the components that all emulators have in common, I guess, video and input and that sort of thing, right? Right, yeah, and, and not just emulators, but, you know, games in general. They all pretty much do a lot of the same stuff. Uh, they're more alike than they are different in a lot of ways. Um, with all of them, you want to have uh, input coming from the user. You have output in the form of video frames and audio samples. Um, and meanwhile, you want to do stuff to those audio samples, the post-processing like pixel shaders, and uh, we also do uh, audio filters and that kind of stuff. So... All of those things people have come to expect from uh, not just any emulators, but also other programs. Uh, meanwhile, everybody that's out there writing an emulator has to reinvent the wheel each time. They have to figure out how to do pixel shaders. They have to write their own pixel shaders. They have to uh, write their own audio filters. And even more basic than that, they have to write their own input output usually through sdl or um qt something like that and we say uh, input are, output we're talking about the game controller that we have connected right yeah and the video and the audio like mm -hmm. they have to they have to like the the emulators themselves that do the interpretation of the software they spit out stuff in a form and then we have to take that and present it to the user in some way and so everybody was having to jump over these same hurdles every single time um, so the big uh, light bulb moment for Live Retro was uh, instead of doing that, why don't we um, have a way to separate the front end and the back end? And anybody can write a front end and anybody can write a back end. Because uh, also, incidentally, as I mentioned before we um, started recording, the people who write the back ends don't always care about the front end stuff. Right. And the people who write the front end stuff aren't always very good at writing the back end. I think anyone who's ever tried to just download MAME and run it has probably experienced what you just talked about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, which I, I can't really knock MAME because yeah. uh, people people give uh, us a hard time about usability too. So, uh, right, it's, of course. You know, it's a, it's, that's a, a tough thing, um, trying to write something that is 
universal and uncomplicated. That's kind of a you know an oxymoron there. Especially in the case of MAME, where they're they're mashing up you know thousands of different systems that are all yeah. being emulated uniquely. So it's uh, and I it's funny because I just I just hear from viewers often about hey how do I get this thing working? How do I find the right ROM to go with this? And right. um, you know clearly it it it's it's complicated because it is complicated. But this is an attempt yep. maybe to to kind of centralize that. So Lib Retro yeah. is kind of the overarching thing here, right? This is like a an API library. We're standardizing how things are working. Are most emulators working with LibRetro now? Um, I wouldn't say most, but a, a, a large number. And uh, thankfully, that there's a lot of users that use, uh, if not RetroArch, other LibRetro front ends. There's, there's more than RetroArch, even though RetroArch is the one that most people know about. Um, there's also GNOME games and Linux. Uh, BizHawk uh, can play LibRetro cores and uh, OpenEMU doesn't exactly use LibRetro, but it's easy for them to adapt our stuff into theirs. Um, and then, um, let's see, uh, Cody, uh, their retro player, mm -hmm. uh, does LibRetro as well. So so there's a, a number of other front ends, even though RetroArch is the one that people commonly associate with it. But as long as the front end can speak LibRetro and so can the back end, any of them can get together. And then by cores, you're talking about the emulators themselves. So I could, right, I, I could of course, ends. go and download MAME or, or, or SNES 9X or something on my own. But if I download the core that's compatible with LibRetro uh, and I'm using a LibRetro compliant front end, Mm -hmm. um, you're standardizing all of the input output and the, the mm -hmm. emulator core is just doing the, the processing and that the functions that require that emulation. Is that a fair? Yeah, it's, it's the, the cores are still doing the, the heavy lifting. Um, we're, we're just taking what they've done and presenting it to the user. So, it, and, and in some ways it might be easier for somebody to go in that route than it would be to download all these emulators separately, I guess. Is that yeah kind of, right yeah. and and uh, with the um the reinventing the wheel part of it uh you also if you if you want to set up 25 different emulators you have to map 25 controllers you mm -hmm. have to set up 25 save directories and so on uh with retroarch you do it once uh, and, and that's that extends to all of your cores so it's and that way it simplifies a lot of things um, but the the back ends, like I said, are really doing the heavy lifting, and that's um, something that we wanted to make sure of as we uh, did RetroArch. Is we want people to know what back end they're dealing with. We don't we don't take people's emulators and then rename them to you know Live Retro Super Nintendo or something like that. We we make sure that the name of the emulator is still easily visible and everybody knows what they're doing uh, because that's that's it's really a partnership you know they're really doing they're doing their part and we're doing ours and i've noticed that too that i can have if i'm trying to emulate the nintendo 64 or something i have a choice of different cores that can do the same thing but maybe do it differently for certain games right right yeah and that's that's another uh, common complaint is that um, a lot of people when they first use it they're like why are there a dozen super nintendo cores why don't you just hand me the best one uh, well, we, there isn't a best one. There's there's the best one for a given task, but uh, we don't, you know, RetroArch runs on like 20 different platforms or something, including right. consoles. And so right. there's uh, there's no one perfect one. And on top of that, you know, like even if I have a strong uh, laptop, I may want to use Hegon on a uh, while I'm plugged in, but then switch to SNES 9X when I'm on battery uh, just to uh, save some juice. So, uh, it's, you know, we want to give people those choices and let them choose for themselves. Right, which is probably the best way to go because you're, you're able to be supportive of everybody's efforts versus picking and choosing winners and, <laughs> and losers and all of this. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's, a, that's another thing is, you know, we don't want to get into the business of picking, you know, winners and losers as far as emulators because they're, again, they're such complicated, difficult pieces of software to write and they're labors of love for the authors and we would really hate to just tell somebody like, well, you know, we think this one's better, and so we're going to push it on everybody. Like that's we we want everybody to be able to appreciate all of the work. And this is an open source effort, meaning that mm -hmm. you're you're not a company. There's only a, a few you know handful of volunteers that are volunteering, mm -hmm. uh, right. do, doing all of this. Nobody's getting getting paid or making any money for this. Uh, how how did it come about that that a bulk of of popular emulation um, has been open source and and free? Well, uh, I think for a long time it was just a uh, defense mechanism uh, that as long as it was open source, uh, you, a company couldn't stamp it out. 
Um, because for a long time, and I mean, you know, you can look at Nintendo's, uh, website, they have a page that asks about emulation, like an FAQ. Mm -hmm. And pretty much what they tell you is that it's always illegal under any circumstances, right. which uh, is so not true, right? <laughs> right. No, it's definitely not. Uh, but so they're, they're very much not into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand, you know, I, I, I get it. That's, you know, that's a reasonable stance for a business to have. Um, but so I think a lot of the uh, early open source volunteerness, people not using their real names, um, just using screen names, uh, that was, I think, largely a defense mechanism so that a company couldn't just come and stamp them out. Um, SNES 9X and MAME, uh, MAME has since changed their license, but for many years uh, was strictly non-commercial. It said right in the license that you could never exchange money for it. It was mm -hmm. always, um, it couldn't be used for businesses, um, particularly they didn't, they didn't want a company to take MAME and then start selling bootlegs or anything like right. that. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was, um, so that things couldn't be involved in businesses, um, so that companies wouldn't come and try and sue people or stamp it out. And, and to a large degree, that, that, has, that has stuck. I guess maybe there's some changes now that there is some real commercial interest in this kind of stuff. And I think back to a, uh, an emulator. There was two of them in particular. One was by a company called Connectix back in the, mm -hmm. in the 90s when the PlayStation 1 was still the console that was the current generation. Yeah. Uh, they, gener they, they were able to really do perfect emulation of the PS1 on the Mac. In fact, I think Steve Jobs was was out promoting this software, yeah, and yeah. Sony was not happy about that. And then they also right. sued uh, Bleem. Remember Bleem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they sued yeah. them out of existence, who had a... I guess if you ran the games on the Dreamcast, it looked better than the PlayStation version did. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, and Bleem's a funny thing. That's another uh, really seminal case for us as far as legality of emulation, uh, and a lot of people... Um, well, a lot of people uh, over-apply the ruling to think that, like, because... Bleem actually won the case. Um, Sony lost by pretty much every measure. Uh, and so that's, you know, people often cite it as like, hey, emulation is 100% legal, um, which unfortunately is not actually the case. There are a lot of times where it, it may not be legal, but as long as you, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's, then it will be. Um, but yeah, the, the sad thing is, is that Bleem did win, uh, but they just didn't have the money to keep going after right. Sony sued them over, you know, for this long period of time, they just bankrupt. It was a Pyrrhic victory because they, they had yeah. won the, won the battle and lost the war they, Sony just threw all the money at them. They just couldn't, right. they couldn't possibly keep defending themselves without lawsuit after lawsuit. So, right. Uh, yeah. It was a classic David and Goliath thing. Yeah. So, so largely what's happened here is that everything has been free and open source. And if, and if mm -hmm. somebody, um, not for non-commercial purposes, if I wanted to, let's say, create my own free, uh, thing to, to emulate stuff, um, mm -hmm. I could, I could use your code and, and freely mm -hmm. do that. Now, if I, if I make any changes to the code, I'm supposed to make that available to the world. Is that how it's supposed to work? Correct. Yeah, that's um, the the most common license that people use for open source stuff is the GPL, the GNU public license. And that's one of its stipulations is that um, you can make changes to it. And as long as you don't distribute any binaries, then um, no harm, no foul. So as long as you're just playing around on your own computer, no problem. Mm -hmm. But the minute you start handing out builds to people, any changes you've made, um, you have to give them if they request it. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's how we keep everybody giving. And so in that instance, if somebody were to try to uh, package that binary into a commercial product, is that uh, allowable if they share the source code? If they so share the source code, yeah. Um, they have to, um, well, and, and that's, the, it starts getting complicated mm. there. They have, to, they have to share back the source code, and depending on which version of the GPL the software is under, um, if it's GPL v3, there's also some added stipulations of um, what they call the anti tiboization clause, okay. <laughs> where you, you have to be able to um, take that GPL program out and replace it with your own compiled version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's where even people who give back their source code so far have pretty much always failed on the anti tiboization which is a big problem for us because RetroArch is GPL v3. So what they're supposed to be able to do is is pull that code out and have it have it functional. What's the? I'm just trying to understand that a little better. 
Uh, what they should be able to do is if you buy a, a product that runs RetroArch, you mm. should be able to, um, since most of these are boxes that don't attach to the internet or anything, right. uh, you can't really update them. So if we add, you know, some fancy new shader or some, you know, like awesome feature that does your taxes or whatever, you should be able to, uh, not that that's a thing we would put in right. there, but, you know. <laughs> well, you never know. It, it does everything else. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, say you want to be able to do that, you should be able to go down, um, download our source code from GitHub, compile it, and put that new binary on the device, but nobody's doing that. Okay, and so what's happened now over the last couple of years is that as you know, I, I would, I would, I guess we could say that emulation has moved from a hobby uh, for some mm -hmm. uh, into a commercial thing because I, you know, I, th I think you can point to the NES Classic Edition as a great mm -hmm. example of <clears throat> mass market appeal of yeah. emulation. I mean, that that little mm -hmm. box is a is a real cheapo <laughs> Android yeah. system on a chip, right, or or, or a similar right. processor. Um, yeah, it's it's not quite as good as a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yep, and but it does it does its its single purpose well, and I think it mm -hmm. got. Um, certainly, the, the virtual console from Nintendo was popular over the years. We've had all these little, um, yeah. uh, you know, compilations that have come out mm -hmm. for various consoles. But um, we've seen a lot of hardware now since this NES Classic thing happened. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, and and really, the um, you can go even farther back than the NES Classic for when emulators got to be big business. It all started with um, the Google Play Store. That was when uh, people realized that that was when the gold rush happened. Mm. Um, but since then. Uh, the NES Classic really made it um, a lot more legitimate. A lot of the ones on the Play Store still had this like weird air of piracy around them, and yeah. a lot would get taken down. And uh, even worse, uh, a lot of them were not commercialized by the original authors. A lot of them didn't follow the licenses from the original programs. They would take open source programs and close them up and just wrap a Java interface around them and sell them for a couple of bucks. Uh, and a bunch of people made a bunch of money off of that. Um, was Google helpful in in d helping you defend your rights? No, terrible. Really? Uh, and yeah, uh, they're well, and they're and they're terrible in both ways. Pretty much anybody uh, can get your program taken down for almost no reason. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then uh, Google won't even tell you who did it or why. Oh, so one of these guys could take down your free version of what they stole. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 really uh, <laughs> really right. shocking how bad it is. Yeah, so and so somebody could steal your code, sell it. I don't want to say steal it, but they take this open source right. code, they compile it into their own app. Uh, yeah, they sell it for five bucks, and then that person come back and and get yours pulled down when you're offering it for free. Yep, one hundred percent. Yeah, wow. uh, and and there's very little recourse for that. Uh, they have like an appeal system, but as with anything at Google. Uh, it is pretty much impossible to talk to a human being uh, right. about anything. Right, and 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 I think there's some difficulties too when you're you know a collective of, of volunteers with with no commercial uh, product behind you. There, there's little money right. to defend this stuff. And then we've had some other issues too. And I and I'm referring now to, to Daniel uh, D. Matei's um, blog posts over the last couple mm -hmm. of weeks, and something I talked about um, back in February when he posted this mm -hmm. uh, that RetroArch, in, in in the opinion of the Retro, has been uh, not has been essentially stolen to some degree for a number of commercial products. And uh, it's, it's, it's really caused some issues within the community because everyone's working so hard and all of a sudden these people can come along and just, just take your code and sell it in a box. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's really unfortunate. What's happened with that? Uh, well, pretty much just that. Um, and you know, and a lot of people say uh, like the common refrain I see from uh, people on Reddit are um, how can you steal something that's freely available? And it's uh, people use the term theft. Uh, it's it's license infringement is what it is. Um, you know, the, like I said, a lot of the programs, uh, a lot of the back ends, SNES 9X, uh, a lot of the older snapshots of MAME that we use for lower power machines, um, Final Burn Alpha, which is another arcade emulator, uh, Genesis Plus GX, uh, really important pivotal emulators. Uh, are all licensed non-commercial, and you straight up can't use those for commercial stuff. It's right there in the license, uh, but a lot of people do it anyway. Uh, RetroArch is um, GPL v3. You can use it for commercial stuff as long as you do your other stuff, as long mm. as you share your source code, and as long as you abide by the anti-TiVoization. Uh, but again, nobody's doing that stuff either, so uh, there's there's a lot of problems all throughout it. And, you know, another common refrain that we hear is that it's like, um, like 
why do you even care? And it's like, well, we, you know, we work hard on this stuff, you know, like, and, you know, we put it out there. We just wanted to make something cool that we could use. And we wanted to share it with other people who want to do the same stuff. You know, we just wanted to make a nice thing and give it to people. And uh, the, the analogy that I've used a lot is um, if somebody, you know, if you give somebody um, something free, you don't want them to come around and then sell it to the next person. Right, you know, like right. it's, it's like regifting, but worse. Right. And, uh, you know, or like if you were out there handing out chocolate sundaes, you don't want somebody standing right next to you selling spoons. It's, uh, you know, it, it's just it, it doesn't make you want to keep doing it. And I think in the case of software, which is recognized by law as intellectual property more than right. a physical pro I mean, in the in the case of a physical product, you know, the the first sale doctrine or whatever it is, you know, would mm -hmm. allow you to sell sell that widget to somebody else. But in the case of software, it's it's intellectual property, which has, you know, a, established license around it, which which, which right. you have just described, and uh, people are are using it in in ways that aren't appropriate. And um, people can go on and and look at some of the. I'll put links to uh, some of these posts so people can see exactly who okay. the <laughs> offenders are for uh for this for this issue. And it doesn't look like it's been resolved either because it looks like some of these companies are continuing to sell these emulation boxes. Yeah. Um, some that I've re reviewed on the channel, not even knowing that that retro arc was being treated this way. Uh, and and they haven't stopped, even though they're saying they're trying to do better, but they're still infringing in the process here right right yeah and and i understand for a company that's uh, i know for a fact that several of them uh contracted with a specific guy and uh he told them everything was on the up and up uh and they weren't uh, but you know that that doesn't completely absolve them but i understand and then um you know once they've sunk the money into it it's you can't very well um you know or i mean it's hard to it's a hard sell to say hey um, stop selling the stuff that you've already sunk all your costs into. Right. I understand that's, that's, you know, um, but at the same time they, they should. Right. And, and what stops you from suing everybody is what? Uh, the, mostly the fact that we just have no money. We're broke. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all hobbyists. Yeah. And again, and there, and there's, there's no physical entity here, right? It's not, a, it's not a company or, a, or, a, or, a, is there an organizational, um, uh, registration somewhere that has you defined as an entity or is it just an open source? Yeah. Group? Uh, just, just very recently we've been working toward actually setting up a limited liability company that we can use for some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, cause as it is right now, we don't want to get into a protracted legal battle uh, where something could happen and it comes back on us and they take my house that my family lives in. Right. I don't want that to happen. No. So, uh, <laughs> so we're working on setting up an LLC that uh, will protect us from that sort of stuff if we decide to do anything um, with any more muscle to it than just complaining on the Internet. And the other problem we have here, too, because as you described it, re retro, you know, lib retro and retro arc are a f kind of a front end and a back end. But mm -hmm. there there's there's cores that have other people's work in them. And I was reading one right. one article, I think it was in Eurogamer, which was really I think, mm -hmm. a good explanation of everything, where um, not only is it the, the retro arc component or the re lib retro component, but anyone who's ever contributed code has to agree to the commercialization of that code. Is that is that a fair uh, statement? Yeah, yeah. Depending on the license, uh, and that's a that's a thing with with any kind of open source project. Um, if you want to change the license after the fact, you have to get everybody's permission because everybody has uh, their own copyright on it. So uh, you can either rewrite the stuff that they did, like take it out and redo it, uh, or you can get their permission. Uh, Mame recently went through a huge relicensing. Uh, which uh, and they they said that they contacted every single contributor, which uh, is is incredible to me. We we can't even contact all of them, and we've only been around for less than half the time as them. So so I'm I'm very impressed that they were able to do that uh, and get it relicensed. We can't even get in touch with people who are active contributors. Right, and in some cases, you might have people. You know, we're we're 25 years plus, perhaps, into some of the, this code. So there could be people yeah. who've passed away, and now their estate has some ownership of it, and. Um, right, most and, definitely. Right, so it's got to be incredibly difficult to 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 take something that was once open source and and commercialize it in some way that can be fair to everybody. Um, yeah. So that's a challenge too. And yeah, and, definitely. And it's got to be really grating just to have these companies just pushing out these boxes. And and I guess in some cases you you don't really know you know what the emulation cores are of even what Nintendo. We're not accusing Nintendo of anything here, but right. but 
you know, in the case of a Nintendo thing or a compilation, uh, it's possible they could have just used that open source code and they've got it so embedded and encrypted in all these, you know, commercial uh, uh, Xbox and, and Sony and Nintendo things yeah. that you may not even know it's in there, right? Well, that was a funny thing that um, when people disassembled the virtual console ROMs, they found INES headers on the ROMs. Um, so, I mean, it, there, there are a bunch of potential explanations for it, but the Occam's razor there is that Nintendo just went and downloaded the ROMs from the internet. <laughs> that was uh, right. So, so they could be using like pirated ROMs in their, <laughs> in their own uh, commercial right. thing. Right. Yeah. Which I mean, you know, I mean, I guess they're not technically pirated since they're their own, but you know, it's, it's still, it, it's funny for as much as they rail on it, it, it was easier for them just to do that than to reinvent the wheel themselves. Right, and try to do that. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge here is just how do, you, how do you even start to commercialize this stuff? And it looks like a lot of these companies are just banking on the fact that uh, you won't come after them, but it looks right. like... Shoot first, are, ask questions later. Yeah, yeah, or ask for permission versus... For, or ask for forgiveness versus permission or something. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, or, you know, in this case, just hope that it's a bunch of poor dudes that can't come around and <laughs> do anything about it. Right. And it looks, though, I mean, that, that you're trying to move in that direction. I mean, there's there's obviously the LLC being formed here in the United States. Right. Obviously, there's a uh, even more complicated scenario here of, of international boundaries and how this intellectual right. property can be recognized from one place to the other. Is there is there a, you know, kind of a, a standard for how people treat the GPL license internationally? I, I know people that are, you know, using open source code have to comply with that. Is there a legal standard for that or is it just going to have to be a country by country thing? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm not really equipped to answer it. Um, from what I've seen from other people on the Internet, uh, like other projects, uh, it, it seems to have uh, enough international sway that, you know, it's, um, I guess, as good as anything. Mm. Um, so uh, luckily for products to sell in a country, they have to abide by those jurisdictions. And so, you know, if they're selling some weird pirate box somewhere that's uh, that doesn't really respect any copyright at all well mm -hmm. we'll probably just have to write those off <laughs> yeah if they're right. going to be selling them in the u.s and europe mm -hmm. uh, we can probably do something about it so now cody's been dealing with that in that there you know there's yep. there's hundreds of thousands of these boxes being sold and they're they're getting support requests from people looking asking right. why their their pirated uh, movies aren't playing and and it's yeah uh, it, it's challenging so i'm sure that might be yeah. something that you have in your future too yeah, that's a that's a super scary thing that we're you know aware of being a possibility, and I, I the the Cody guys uh, have done a really admirable job dealing with it. Um, that's uh, you know like they they complain about it, but I know it's they're they're still banging out awesome versions and they're keeping their spirits up, and that's that's really impressive. And so kudos to them. Um, I know it's that's another that's a big risk with Lib Retro is that it will just get associated with crummy pirate boxes and drag our name through the mud like has happened to Cody. I mean, what was it? Um, like Congress did something about Cody recently and, um, it was, or no, it was, uh, Google. That's what it was. I'm, I'm sorry, not Congress at all. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> but Google, um, started, um, uh, not allowing Cody and autocomplete stuff, which is a small oh, step, but it's yeah. still, you know, like that's, that's not their fault. That's right. not their fault that this is going on. They've done really well and managed to keep everything on the up and up. It's not their fault that these people are doing this stuff. But yeah, they're being so I, punished for it. I'm just looking at that on the verge here, right? So they removed Cody from autocomplete searches. So if you type in KO, you're not going to get the DI on the end of the thing if you're not aware of the full name, I guess, for example. So it's it's uh, it, it's kind of it's, it's almost collateral damage for all this piracy yeah. going on. And right. It almost feels like they're. I mean, it sounds like you know maybe you guys have been in touch with the Cody people, or there's some some mutual admiration there. It almost feels yeah. like this might be a good opportunity to maybe create some kind of overarching organization kind of like a you know uh i don't know uh, uh the you know the, uh, the the legal group that 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 helps out a lot of free speech on the internet what is that the, oh uh, yeah right um it, it escapes me now that i'm recording but you know what i'm talking about like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the internet freedom foundation um you mm -hmm. know that that having some some organization that might help some of these open source projects as they mature because it's you know it's commercial grade now i mean it, in the sense right. that it's it's solid it works it's easy to use it's on every platform that you can think of it's it's being used by millions of people around the world um, is well, there any, any uh, talk of that? Well, there's there's already existing organizations that are supposed to be doing a lot of that mm. stuff. Um, you know, the whenever we've had problems, that's another thing is everybody always says, like, uh, you know, talk to the Free Software Conservancy or the um, uh, the FSF or uh, the EFF. We've talked to um, the um, FSF and the EFF. 
And, and in both cases, they, um, you know, they, the FSF even says right on their site that they're like, um, you know, we'll, we'll help anybody, you know, even if it's not our own project. Mm-hmm. But uh, when we talked to them, they were just like, ah, sorry, guys, best of luck to you. Maybe try talking to the EFF. Right, when we yeah. talked to the EFF, they said the exact same thing, right. pointing us to the FSF. So it's kind of a shell game there. Um, they, I guess to some um, degree, because your your speech is not being impeded, or, and no one's issuing subpoenas against against you, it's it's less. It's more of a commercial dispute, for, and I guess maybe in their eyes, perhaps, than anything, right? Right. Well, and a lot of the like the FSF is supposed to defend GPL software. Mm-hmm. Like that's defending the GPL is supposed to be their deal. So you know, I, I'm not really sure why they didn't want to do anything for us. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's emulator gray market type stuff. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, but for whatever reason, they they just um, told us can't really do anything for you. It seems like so, there's some hope though, because it, it from it looks like one you know one of the, one of these companies has taken their product off the market while they research this. Is that I think that's still going on, right? Um, yeah, and that's that's largely been the just like uh, the tenacious bulldoggery of uh, Daniel, the lead developer. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's really just been tireless on it. Um, the rest of us, you know, it 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 bums us out, and we just kind of shrug our shoulders and move on. But mm-hmm. he's he really is um, stayed with it uh, way longer than any of us have been able to stomach it, and it's that's really through his tireless work that that's happened. And and I'm guessing it's got to, it, it, you know, maybe not for you, but I'm sure maybe others have decided maybe it's not worth my time to invest any more of my free time into this if, if it's going to be taken and used in a, in a commercial box like that. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And there's been a huge upsurge in closed source uh, commercial emulators mm-hmm. lately, um, you know, not just um, uh, particularly on uh, Google Play Store, but since then as well, um, but of people saying like, you know, why would I want to write something that's open source just to have some jerk come take it and sell it? Uh, and that's, you know, it, it really, you know, bums me out that that's happening because open source is a big deal for me. Uh, you know, it's a thing I really care about and to see it, uh, just getting, um, you know, kneecapped by unscrupulous, uh, people just trying to make a business. It's a real shame. Yeah, no, it, it, it's unfortunate. And I think it's one of those things that I'm been very mindful of since learning of this about, you know, when I'm looking to review things, um, to, to maybe do some research up front on those. And, and let's, let's talk about kind of the status of, of emulation in general and some of these boxes, mm-hmm. because I'm looking at some, you know, some of these, these clone consoles I'm seeing, like there, there was one I reviewed recently that was a super Nintendo and a Nintendo box in one it wasn't mm-hmm. emulating. It actually had its own chip. Um, yeah. So mm-hmm. that that I'm assuming is probably safe in the sense that it's not running your code. Is that sa- is fair to assume? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and a lot of those um, hardware clones are really great. Um, you know, they may have some problems here and there. Some games may not work or whatever. They may not fit Super FX chips or whatever. Um, but you know, aside from those couple of warts, those things are great. I really like them. Um, and they do a really important job of keeping down prices on original hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you do any kind of hardware collecting, you know already those things are expensive, but you think of how much more expensive they would be if they were the only thing. If you couldn't go buy a $60 retro trio or whatever, um, then they would be so much worse. And I guess it's hard to know which boxes do this versus not, right? I mean, it, I, right. I, I, mean I, I know knowing what's emulated versus what's hardware, but it's really hard for a consumer to know, I guess. The yeah, and and the the easy tell used to be um, if it outputs HDMI, then it's an emulation box. That's not the case anymore because a lot of the hardware clones have started putting composite to HDMI upscalers, um, like the same ones that you would buy from Amazon for twenty bucks or whatever. They're putting those on uh, the same board mm-hmm. as the emulator or not emulator the uh, the clone. So it's taking that and then cloning it in H- HDMI. So you can't even judge by that anymore. Now it's there's no real easy way to tell. <laughs> it's not easy, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's, um, it's a game of whack a mole for you guys. Right, right. Um, one other easy tell is save states. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hardware clones aren't going to have save states. Right, right. Which is something that those, those emulation clones might likely have. And I, I've even seen people right. in my my local like Facebook for sale group, you know, just buying up Android boxes and putting a bunch of emulators and ROMs on them and selling those. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, and it's the the Cody thing all over. Yeah, uh, no, it's yeah, the same, same thing for RetroPie. Uh, people selling like you know, fully loaded RetroPie installations. And it's, you know, it's no more legal for them than it is for the Cody resellers. Unbelievable. Well, I, I don't even know where to start on, or, or to finish on this topic, but it just seems like it, it's just so difficult um, to get to, to even just 
get that enforcement around. And I guess the best thing you can do is, is to call out the, the most popular people in the field. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, some of these companies have people have a good vibe from, from them. They feel like they're good. They make good products. And it, it's kind of right. surprising, disappointing when I learned about the companies that are doing this just to hear that. So perhaps some yeah. of that public shaming might might be useful for the larger players in the game. Right. Yeah. And one one thing I want to, um, you know, say that, you know, that's that's an unfortunate thing that we just have to deal with. And we don't, you know, hold that against anybody for, you know, anybody who reviews these things. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, like I, I think it's just people not knowing. And even if they do know, I, I understand it's a complicated topic and it's it's a boring topic. Right. You know, like if you don't have. Uh, a dog in the race, I can understand that it's it's not something a lot of people care about. They just want to be able to play their games. And right. I, I understand that. And it's, um, you know, it's no hard feelings uh, toward any of the end users or anything mm -hmm. like that. No, we, of course uh, not. No, no. You know, yeah. yeah so uh, and, and it's not a thing that we like to harp on. Like, we don't want to just be these negative Nellies right. always <laughs> complaining about licenses and right. stuff. You know, like we, we're really just trying to put a cool thing out there for people to enjoy. It's, it's a shame that this has gotten involved in it at all. I'll tell you what, I have a feeling that, it, you know, when, when all is said and done, this could be a decade or two from now, but I, but I, I feel like this, this might be the thing that finally gets some kind of, of standard set legally for how open source software is used in a commercial purpose because you know, clearly we've seen, seen it with Linux installations all the time, mm -hmm. but um, this is an area where you know, this, is, this is a very lucrative uh, code base that is yeah. in, in some cases being abused that I, I think right. at some point is going to have to come back to roost. Now I want to talk a little bit now about the new kids on the block. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So uh, one emulator, you know, we've got emulators now that are, that are getting closer to some of the more modern consoles that are out there. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one called uh, Citra, which is the 3DS mm -hmm. emulator, which I think is a core now inside of yeah. RetroArch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm seeing really another awesome. one called Cmu. I mean, look, they look amazing. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Wii U emulator called Cmu. And one thing I've noticed with these emulators is that they they've set up Patreons to mm -hmm. to bring mm -hmm. in revenue. This is kind of a new thing, right? Right. Uh, yeah, and that's we we also have a Patreon. Um, that was our first foray into not being 100% strictly no money involved. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, that's a, a different way of looking at it. And as long as, um, like, you know, it's funny that you bring up Citra and Simu. Um, Simu's caught a lot of flack from the community because they are closed source. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, for a while, their pat Patreon was bringing in a crazy amount of money. It was like $30,000 a month or right. something. It's gone down a bit. Um, it's 12000 now, but that's still quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's still, still a ton of money. Um, and... A lot of the old timers in the community uh, were really worried that that was going to bring some heat because it's uh, a currently, um, you know, it was it was, you know, competing with Nintendo's official current console. Right. Uh, for, you know, putting out games and having them emulated on day one and that kind of thing. Uh, so it, and then when you bring in that huge amount of money, it it was a, a pretty scary time. We were we were very worried. I'm glad that the smoke is cleared. The Wii U is not Nintendo's main thing anymore and um and their their money aspect I'm not I'm not saying I'm glad they're not making as much money but I'm right. <laughs> I'm glad that it's become less of a thing right uh, yeah but but uh I've only used Cmu a little bit myself uh, because I'm you know I'm big into open source stuff so you know not knocking anybody who makes a closed source Cmu but I'm not going to use it um but uh, all the same Cmu is very impressive, a, a really, uh, really cool program. And, and like some of the other ones from the '90s, it's it's it, the stuff is you know, rendering better than it does on the actual <laughs> the actual yeah, console, right? right? So it's right, the, yeah, you can yeah play a uh, uh, 4K 60 frames per second with it, yeah, right. And, and I'm guessing maybe the reason CE even went in this direction is because of the maybe some of the challenges you're dealing. I mean, it's hard to say we don't have them on the show to ask, but I mean, I'm yeah. guessing that closed source was was a choice to maybe prevent that code from leaking out that way. Uh, very possible. Um, there is an open source uh, Wii U emulator that um, is doing much better we, we, than uh, people give it credit for. Uh, it's not, you know, booting a ton of games and like doing day one compatibility like Simu was. So it's not really like, uh, you know, drawn the eyeballs, but it's really doing really well. And that's decaf. OK. Uh, and so anybody should uh, check that out if they want a, a Wii U emulator that they can help contribute to. Um, they are in desperate need of uh, more muscle. So anybody who's into writing emulators, if you want to pitch into decaf, it's there. Uh, the guys working on it are really good guys. 
Uh, which I hear the same thing from the CMU guys. I hear mm-hmm. they're they're good fellas. Um, but, it seems like yeah. everyone has a good has a good spirit about this. It's not it's not a cutthroat industry here. People are are, are probably appreciative and respectful and and perhaps uh, uh, in awe sometimes of each other's abilities. Yeah. Oh man, I tell you what. Um, probably the most uh, lucrative commercial emulator um, for a console emulator that's ever been written um, is Drastic on Android. Mm-hmm. The DS emulator okay. written by. Um, guy named exophase okay um and some of these people don't even have the real names right like you only know them by exophase right (laughs) oh yeah yeah (laughs) and and honestly i mean uh daniel uh our lead developer i didn't even know his name until like last year i just never bothered (laughs) to look (laughs) in fact i never heard his voice until like six months ago it's like the old hacker ethos you go by your handle that's it yeah totally uh but yeah so uh exophase a really cool guy who um has done really awesome open source uh, work in the past but uh, he, you know, he knew he was going to, um, make a ton of money off of writing drastic closed source and he did, and he continues to make a ton of money on it. Uh, I hope that one day he'll open source it, but I know from seeing some of his other work that it's, um, a lot of the tricks that he uses to get so much speed, make it, um, not, not super useful for other stuff. Mm. So it's not a huge loss that it's closed, but so it's per, it would be right, it's very specific nice. for that use. Yeah, right. And um, and really, the the code is pretty much like single purpose. Um, some of the other stuff he worked on, uh, PCSX Rearmed, um, which is the uh, PlayStation emulator core that we use on uh, ARM devices uh, like cell phones and stuff. Um, he wrote the uh, the renderer for it, and it is amazing. It's like I mean, my my crummy Epic 4G that I've have had for like five years or six years even. Um, it runs PlayStation games full speed on it, wow. and it's because because of what he did. Uh, he wrote a uh, Game Boy Advance emulator on PC, uh, uh, PSP, uh, GPSP is what it's called, uh, and it runs Game Boy Advance games full full speed on a PSP. It's wow. really amazing stuff. That's amazing, and you know, it, it, I guess there's probably some frontiers here that we haven't haven't yet crossed in the emulation world. I'm thinking about like why why can't we get an emulator of the original Xbox, or is there one? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a that's a common question. Uh, it comes up about once a month on uh, the emulation subreddit. Somebody's right. like, you know, how come we have um, you know a, a Wii U emulator that works great, but we don't have a working Xbox emulator? Um, there's a, there's a lot of a uh, lot of stuff having to do with that. It's it's an interesting thing. Um, some of it has to do with uh, the number of exclusives and how many people uh, are really passionate about that console because emulators are really um a real like passion thing you know you it's there they take so much hard work so many thousands of hours of time you can't write one unless you really like care about the platform uh and evidently there just aren't that many people that feel so passionate about uh, the og xbox Mm. Uh, likewise it didn't really have very many um, uh, exclusives. Almost right. everything came out either on uh, PC or on Dreamcast or PS2 or whatever. So it's um, there aren't a whole lot of uh, must-play games where you just say, either I emulate Xbox or I have no way of playing this. Right. If I want to play Burnout, um, I can go grab my PS2 emulator or my GameCube emulator and, and play my Burnout, right? So it's not, right. A, not a huge thing. What are some of the other areas that are not yet... Touch that you think are are due for something. Um, let's see. Well, well Saturn uh, has been very difficult, right? That's been a difficult yeah, system. That has, and that's uh, it's only been very recently that a lot of stuff has changed with it. Um, uh, Mednafen, uh, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Um, they just put out a Saturn core, I guess, about a year ago, and it just um, you know like popped out fully formed, like ready to go, wow. uh, which is which is really amazing. I love when and, that happens. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wild, uh, and the author of that is um, she's she's a wizard, and um, she any anything she puts out is gonna be good. But she put that out just like blew us all away uh, day one, uh, and there are some people that are working on Xbox emulation that are making good progress. Um, so uh, we should be hearing more from it soon, uh, hopefully. And the Xbox uh, 360 is another one that's that's challenging, I think, right? Yeah, um, the guys that are working on the 360 emulator are, are making good headway, too. They've kind of been eclipsed lately by uh, RPCS3, the PlayStation 3 emulator, mm-hmm. which has just been um, going gangbusters lately. Yeah. Uh, but the um, I, I'm, I'm, it's slipping my mind, the 360 emulator. Um, 
but those those guys have gotten a lot of games booting. It's really it's coming a long way. And it's funny because yeah, the, 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 the closer to the modern era you get, the harder these systems are to emulate, just given how, how, how specific the hardware was and how much it takes to emulate all the things that it does. Yeah, well, and, and there is a, an interesting thing about doing the modern systems. Um, they, like with, with older systems like uh, Super Nintendo or regular Nintendo or Genesis, um, they have to emulate every single component. But as things, um, as the consoles have gotten more like PCs, uh, they've gotten to where they don't have to do that necessarily. Uh, they may have to do it for components, but a lot of it, they mimic API calls. Um, and so in that way, it's kind of like, um, like if you know the difference between virtualization and emulation in PC virtualization, um, instead of emulating the actual bits of the computer, you're translating the system calls. Uh, and that's, um, you can do that a lot faster. That's, uh, that's how they've gotten, you know, PC uh, a PS3 emulator that can run full speed. Um, there's no way we could do that uh, emulating the the cell processors, you know, eight SPUs and all that, all right. the funky stuff that was in a PS3. Uh, but instead, we're able to translate those system calls to OpenGL calls, for instance, and that helps us um, do the upscaling and uh, run a lot faster and do a lot of stuff with a modern machine. So in other words, it's like, all right, I know the PlayStation wants to do this. Um, so what in my operating system does the same thing? Yeah, and, and, right. And basically grab that hook and, and attach it to, to an existing thing in the, in the current OS. And exactly. Is it getting easier now to go between platforms? Because we've got you know, Vulkan out there now. OpenGL has been out for a long time. Uh, I'm a big fan of the NVIDIA Shield because it's a very mm -hmm. powerful you know, TV box that can run almost anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, is it getting it. easier now to port between different platforms like this? Um, yeah, the... Um, a lot of systems, like even even stuff like Raspberry Pis, are you know, I mean, they're more powerful than my desktop machine from a few right. years ago. You know, like they're they're really it's it's uh, it's getting to where you know for for basic emulation, you know, like the consoles that I grew up with and I really care about. Uh, I'm I'm a Super Nintendo Genesis kid. Okay, so uh, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, Thirty five. Okay, so you're I'm forty one. So we we're yeah. in the same right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the game stopped after like the Nintendo sixty four, right? There was no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't emulate a lot of newer stuff. For me, yeah. it was you know the sixteen bit to you know thirty two sixty four is pretty much like that's it for me. Right. Um. But so your yeah, life is fulfilled here. You're you're good. <laughs> yeah, I've been playing the same games for you know. I never yep. really stopped playing Super Mario World. I still play it. But. There there is not a a quarter of the year that goes by where I don't play um uh, the return. Uh, Empire Strikes Back on the Atari 2600. That, that's oh, my, yeah. That, that Walker game, it has no point to it. I just can't stop playing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a classic, you know? Yeah. It, it's, good stuff doesn't die. Right. Uh, but yeah, so it's um, so just the fact that um, just even garbage computers have gotten so powerful, um, it's made a lot of that stuff easier. Um, like some of the stuff that we support with RetroArch, like um, uh, PSPs, like... I think that's about the weakest thing that we support um, nowadays when something comes out. Like we uh, have uh, the Switch. Um, we're starting to get some stuff going right, on that. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and once once you get homebrew on a thing, pretty much everything is powerful enough that, boom, instantly you've got all of the classics on it. Right. So everything, all the cores just come right over and you're, you're in. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. That's awesome. So what are you excited about for the future? What's, what's, uh, what's on your radar screen? Uh, well, there's... Um, something that a guy on our forums has been working on that, uh, like I'm, I'm really big into CRTs. I love them. I got a room full of them. Um, and there's a guy on our forum who is working on getting, uh, resolution switching happening, just like, um, really similar to what groovy Mame does, mm -hmm. uh, where you can feed native resolution into a CRT and it looks just like the original console. Uh, we're working on getting that into uh, mainline RetroArch, so all you have to do is plug it up to a CRT and get the exact same signal out of it, which uh, I'm I'm real happy about. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we've got some good stuff going on uh, with some latency things. Um, and I just saw a, that. It looks like you're, you're so. It looks like you're going to take the button input and 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 almost speed up the the reaction on screen so you don't have to wait for that that graphic to be drawn you're going to execute that command before the sprite gets on the screen is that a fair description of as, it yeah as, as far as the emulator is concerned we're going to make it happen before you actually even push the button oh that's um, that's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah so you don't um, anticipate what i might want to be doing yeah okay yeah. so it's uh, the way it'll work is um 
you know, we, we've for a long time had uh, rewind where we take a state and then we move backwards through those states. Uh, and our net play works on something similar uh, where if um, you, you get two people playing in disparate uh, locations and they if their inputs diverge, you roll back to the last point where they were the same and then you apply their inputs after that. Uh, similar thing is going on here. Uh, the way it works is the game runs a little bit ahead. So mm -hmm. uh, to you, it just looks like it's playing. But then um, if you push a button, it rolls back uh, however many frames you have it set for and then applies your button earlier. Um, that is the, crazy. So it's actually interpreting my input here. So it's not making me better at the game. Right, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's rewinding it's the memory, is, essentially, or the, the, the sequence. Yeah, all it's doing is taking away delay. Huh. Uh, and pretty much every game has some amount of latency built into it. Right. Uh, Street Fighter 4 has four frames of latency. That was a big deal for Street Fighter 5 that it started out with eight. Mm. Um, Super Mario World has two. Uh, and even games like Super Mario World that people think of as having great control and happening instantaneously have these additional frames of latency in there um, within their processing. Hmm. Um, so as long as you... And that, that was set, on the original hardware too or just an emulation yeah. that you're seeing? It? Wow, interesting. Uh, yeah, back in the original hardware, yeah. Huh. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we consider those internal frames of latency. Uh, so as long as you set that run ahead to no greater than the internal frames of latency, you'll see no weird stuff. Wow. Um, so with Super Mario World, if you set it to two frames, all it'll do is just make it seem super snappy. Wow. If it's you set it to... It's blowing my mind. This has been like a pet peeve of mine is like this, this oh, latency yeah. stuff, and I've been covering it for a while, and now I'm going to have to think about how I test this in the future, knowing that there's built-in latency on some of these games. Now. I, mean, I can see them doing yeah. it on, on current hardware just because of, of all the, the, the differences in displays that people have. But, right, uh, right. Wow. Yeah, it's um, yeah. They're even even in older games. In fact, um, I think basically the uh, the only one that I know of that doesn't have it, I think Atari, um, because of the way they um, they didn't do processing in between frames. Mm -hmm. They were always doing what they called racing the beam. Right. And uh, so their processing was happening like as you go. There was a great so, discussion from the founder of Activision on on how he coded. It was it was amazing just how much they did with that hardware it was so limited and yeah, they, they yeah. were they were literally like timing it to when the electron beam of the television was in the right spot <laughs> right yeah and and uh, same thing if you ever go look up how like zappers and even worse than the zapper the super scope six for mm -hmm. the super nintendo if you go look up how those things work uh just like amazing marvels of technology how simple and elegant and bulletproof they are i was just playing duck hunt with my daughter a little bit before we got on here and uh you know it's, it's i'm playing with the zapper that's from 1985 yeah and it's still you know like works perfectly uh even though the the way it works is is mind-blowing when you read about it i'm jealous you got a daughter that wants to play video games with you mine is like not not happening. <laughs> oh man, it's yeah. I've, I've been trying to get it going on. She's still she's three and a half. She doesn't really get the idea of a win condition yet. Yeah, so, right, right. You know, <laughs> but I'm I'm working on it. Because my mine uh, I have two, so I'm hoping my younger one. My my hope is for the younger one. The older one's got no interest. Just oh not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, LOL surprise dolls and My Little Ponies. And uh, what, I, what oh, I love yeah. about this this uh, on your on your website the description here of the of this look of this latency thing is accurate. No way. Fascinating. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and there's, um, yeah, there's, there's no way that this kind of stuff, uh, you know, is, is at all accurate. We're, we're monkeying with time. Yeah. Uh, but that's cool. you know, I yeah, just think but, that's amazing. I, I just really like that concept of just, just running it forward and then rolling it back. And, and it's just amazing when you have all this processing power to do this, um, in yeah, the background. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it relies on being able to run the game um, two, three, four times re, uh, regular speed. So wow. because it's um, if it does a rollback, it has to emulate that many frames within the space of a single frame. So uh, if you've got it looking ahead four frames, it's got to emulate four whole frames in the space of one frame who, to be able to of that? keep it transparent. Um, you know, it's one of those things like a uh, calculus, you know, there were a couple of guys who were all working on the same thing. And it, um, you know, uh, we think of it as Newton's thing, but there are, I think, three different guys who are all playing around with the same concept. Came to the same conclusion. And and yeah. uh, and everyone just kind of works remotely. So it's all in, in on what, a Discord server or something? How do you how do you communicate with each other? Yeah, IRC and Discord and then uh, through GitHub's um, messaging on their uh, issue trackers. 
the guy who actually did this um, goes by Dwedit. Um, I I forget the emulator that he Game Boy Pocket he used to work on, which I think was a PSP emulator as well. Uh, he's another just like really really clever guy, and um, he came up with this uh, the actual implementation. He actually did it. I am not a very good coder at all. Uh, it, I had a similar idea, and I wrote it on my on my blog a couple of years ago uh, about this idea of using rollback to hide latency. Mm-hmm. Um, and he showed up and had the same idea, completely independent, and uh, he actually had the uh, wherewithal and the skills to do it. And he's put it out, and we're just blown away by how cool it is. Yeah, totally patent this because that is something that I think. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I and I, I'm going to wrap up here just because my okay. I can hear my, my daughter starting to play the piano upstairs, and that's of course going to impact the show. But um, oh, yeah. how, how do people how do people get get started on RetroArch? What's the best way to to get this going on, regardless of platform? Um, well, if, if you have a Raspberry Pi, I think the absolute easiest way to do it is to try out LACA. Mm-hmm. It's super easy, and it is a turnkey. Just flash it onto a SD card, plug it in, and you're off to the races. It's ready to go. Um, other than that, if you just go to our website and download, uh, if you're using Windows, just download the Windows 64 package there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it comes with everything you need to get the program launched, and then you can download the rest of the stuff through our interface. Oh, really? So it's all in, in, in contained inside of the interface, so if you want to run this emulator, you grab the core within it, and you're good to go. Yep. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, that's some good advice. So RetroArch is, uh, is the front end, and then uh, mm-hmm. LibRetro is the, is the community behind it. Um, yep. So uh, you know, I just want to thank you for giving us this insight on this, because you know, emulation has come a long way. <laughs> it's continuing yeah. to oh, develop, yeah. and um, it was really great just to talk about some of these challenges that, that you're facing there. Uh, where can people find you, or should they just go to RetroArch to, to uh, find everybody? Come to our forums. Uh, I'm Hunter K at the forums. Um, you can also you can hit us up. We're on Freenode IRC at hashtag RetroArch. Um, we're also on Discord. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Discord. I'm pretty new to it, okay. uh, so I don't really know how you direct people to it. The, but, the old um, farts like us are, are going to stick with IRC because that's the way, way it was <laughs> 25 years ago, and we like it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, email and IRC should be enough for anybody. Exactly. Right. IRC yeah. is always the was always the home of of innovation. So. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, come come see us, and if you guys have any problems getting set up, I've helped many people so i'll help you too excellent well thank you for that and i, I i'm sure people might take you up on that i really appreciate <laughs> you giving us all this time tonight to just get a lay of the land as to what's going on out there and some of the challenges you're facing and uh, thank anytime thanks for having great me. thanks for thanks for being here so i want to thank hunter for uh coming on the show to talk about this stuff in depth and that is exactly what we're shooting for with these podcast episodes are long and detailed kind of looks at different areas of technology we're going to be doing this with a whole bunch of other topics and I could really use your suggestions for people or things that I should be talking to or about, uh, which you can leave me down in the comments section or send me an email at lon at lon.tv because I'm very excited to find some uh, place where people might really like to consume some of this longer form content. So definitely uh, let me know what you think down below or on an email and we'll continue with the next podcast episode next month, which I will announce the topic of Uh, shortly on one of my weekly wrap-up videos. That's going to do it for now. This is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including gold-level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.